the nature of the identity of man is one of the greatest problems that we individually face. If we pause to think about it, we will never in all eternity, at least not this side of the veil, be able to see our own face. Only in the mirror can we behold our likeness. We can see the face of everyone with our physical eyes, but we cannot see our own face. And in a way, this shows to us the nature of identity. When Moses stood upon the great Sinai desert and witnessed the phenomena of the bush that burned and was not consumed, it was the manifest power of the light for all ages because he inquired into the nature, as many men have done, of the deity. Who art thou, Lord, is a later version in the New Testament. But Moses said, what is thy name? It's the same thing. Who art thou? What is thy name? Most of us from time to time have asked ourselves this question, who am I? We have somehow felt the wonder of life, the strangeness of it all, because of its separation and variegation, the differences in people. We've looked at different faces, and we have seen different inscriptions upon the different faces. We have looked upon our own face, and we have seen different appearances in our own countenance. We have seen a countenance of fear as well as a countenance of love. We have seen fear in ourselves as well as love. And we must ask ourselves the source of this fear as well as this love. We are not dealing with the same source when we deal with fear as we are when we deal with love. Fear, of course, has torment, and it is of the earth earthy. It is the result of man's sense of separation from God. Love, of course, is the sense of man's integration or reunion with God, not separation. And so, because man is torn between mortal desire and heavenly desire, which is often confused for him because of the philosophies of the ages as well as the dogmas of the ages, you see, it really poses quite a problem for individuals to be able to solve the, the simple question, who am I? Now we go back to Moses. Moses asked God the question, what is your name? And he said, I am that I am. I am is my name. Go and tell Pharaoh that I am has sent you. Of course, this was spoken in the Egyptian tongue, we assume, or perhaps the Hebraic tongue. Well, it doesn't matter what language you speak it in, whether you say je suis in the French or ich pin, you know. I mean, it doesn't matter what language you speak it in. It's still the same, but in the English, the translation of I am, going back to the ancient sensar language, involves the om sound, in a sense, because here we have the I am, which is very closely related to Om, you see. It is involving the I of the person together with the M of being. And it equates every man with his cosmic reality. Real I Tai. R E A L. Real I Tai. T Y. It is the real tie, or the tie of the eye to reality. And if some time or other you have paused and been frightened of the universe in awe, and you have looked upon yourself till you come almost to the borders of hysteria, 
where you, you actually wonder who created God, which is an inane question, yet has been asked. And if you stand in fear of the answer, then you will be desperately interested, mightily interested in this idea of God as he spoke to Moses. I am that I am. In other words, he told Moses that I am one who has realized self. I am that I am. He had not only realized self, but he had identified and equated with self as the universal, all-powerful, all-wise God. Now somehow or other, this missing link in the chain of identity has reduced us to a state of where we are somewhat engaged in the business of monkey shining. You know what a monkey shiner is? Somebody who just thinks this is some sort of a game, that we're like a bunch of animals in a zoo. We're just here to swing from the chandeliers. This is not the purpose of living at all. Yet we can have a great deal of pleasure and joy and happiness in spiritual things. We can even enjoy some of the antics that we ourselves have engaged in in past times. But we must recognize, as St. Paul said, when I was a child, I spake as a child. When I became a man, I put away childish things. And so we must not really be ashamed to mature, but be gracious and grateful that the process is available to us, that the nature of being, I am that I am, is possible and available to us. Now what this really means in common sense language is almost startling to every one of you because it means that you, sitting right where you are, whether you're in the seat of the scornful or whether you're in the seat of the illumined, you have the potential and power to become one with God. I am that I am, and it means literally that. It means to become one with the God of very gods. Various people down through the history of the world have been imbued with the idea falsely that they were God. Some of them are in the loony tanks and uh, some of them are still running loose. But there is a genuine concept in this, but it is not the concept that says I and I alone am God. This is the error you see. It's like Mayor Baba. He says, he and he alone is God. And he alone is God, the God of very gods. But you are not God, he is. And this, of course, is the gross error that is involved in it. And I am not speaking to speak against the man, but against the principle which would make anyone to feel that they and they alone are God. For this is a privilege which we all share in the flame of regeneration. The flame of regeneration we're speaking of here is the flame that appeared to Moses in the burning bush. And the reason I call it the flame of regeneration is because this flame does not consume the bush. The statement, our God is a consuming fire, referenced to Hebrews, relates to us the validity of the omnipresent power of God, of the omnipotent power of God. He has the power at any point in space to literally cremate anything if he wants to. You know, I think it was Lord Shankaracharya who cremated his mother after she passed away. He just took his hand, reached out, and the fire came out of his hand and cremated her body very nicely. Well, this, of course, was by the reason of divine power that is within was within his power to draw forth the sacred fire and to perform the ritual of cremation of the mortal remains of his mother. So we see that the fire of God can actually cremate or liquidate 
anything anywhere. It has the power. But now we see the bush, and the bush is not consumed. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is a very important yet moot point to many people. I want to then bring to you the awareness of the all power of God. And in bringing to you the awareness of the all power of God, I want to point out why God, out of divine mercy and grace, permits and encourages this mundane experience. The mundane experience, the experience of incarnation in the flesh, such as we all have right now, our being here, is because of this great law I'm going to point out to you. If God, at this moment, were to call back to himself, literally, every one of the spirit sparks of identity upon the planet, every one of these spirit sparks would start to move from their point in evolution toward the center or the nucleus, the nuclear sun, in the great central sun system. And this callback of the individual spirit spark electrons that would then occur would bring them back from all over the universe to the central sun. Well, you know the legend of Icarus who flew toward the sun with his wings of wax. And when he got so high and the heat began to come down, the wings came off and he went down plummeting to the earth. What would occur in the case of God calling back man is that those who were not perfected as they drew close to the consuming fire would be passed through those fires of transmutation and because they had effected no degree of permanence in their world, they had posited in their world no particular specific momentum of a divine quality, they would then be absorbed into the Godhead as they were before they came forth from the Godhead into the realm of individual identity. And they would then literally lose their life by passing through the second death, which would be the drawing of themselves into the sacred fire. Now the process is one which is perfectly safe for a Christ devotee, for an avatar, for one who has attained, for one who has learned to outpicture in the flesh the patterns in the heavens. Those who understand that the gift of God, the gift of the Spirit of God, is intended to illuminate the whole personality, the whole person, will realize that when the person reaches this point, as we learn in the mysteries of the god Vulcan, which is the basis of the word vulcanize, Vulcan being the god of fire, we are able then to draw this soul, this spirit spark, back to the Godhead with all impunity. There is no punishment involved. There is no annihilation involved. There is only the clasping to the father's heart of the son who has returned to the source from whence he came. But the premature experience would be the second death. And therefore, by cosmic law, cosmic mercy and cosmic grace, God says, touch me not, for I have not yet ascended to my Father, but I go unto my Father, and I go unto your God, and I go unto my God. And where I am, there may ye be also. We then come to the surging realization that God is merciful by permitting this perifical experience, this experience on the perifical realm of life, out here in the realm of the world, in the mundane, in the little circle of identity with people who are evolving, we are able to be perfected. One star differs from another star in glory. Even so is the resurrection from the dead. We see then that experience in the schoolrooms of earth is for the deliverance of the soul, that it may have its own burning reality. And this burning reality is very comforting because the fretwork, the structuring, the poise of identity, the thrust of reality that is God is born 
silently in the soul without fanfare, without annunciation, without recognition by men. It isn't what men see in you that counts. Although he has said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. But they do not often really see because only the few have the vision to see. And the many will form their judgments based on some strange a priori reasoning which is tied greatly to the emotional impact of the moon rather than the sun. Why did I say that? Because Luna, the lunar orb, is somewhat master of the emotional realm of men and it pulls the tides of their emotions as now at this time of the month we are experiencing. But the sun is the symbol of the greater light that rules the day. The moon rules the night, the psychic realm. And we are not interested in psychicism because psychicism merely refers to the old records of life streams from the day of creation and all of the history of individuals through their many embodiments down to the present hour. And none of these experiences in most cases were victorious, but they were the struggle through the earth toward the sun. Man then falling short of the mark cannot compare the experiences of others who are short of the mark with the experiences of the ascended beings and the avatars such as Jesus, Mary the mother of Jesus, Joseph or Saint Germain, Paul the Venetian, Alexander Gaylord who spoke to us this morning, or many others who have passed the supreme test and been initiated into the ritual of the ascension in the light. Well then, we can see now a little clearer than we could before that there is a certain comfort in being upon this ship of fools where individuals fall short of the mark, but it is a questionable comfort indeed when it is measured against the high intent of the spirit because as St. Paul said, we should cast our anchor beyond the veil. And the veil, the concealment factors in life, the things that hide the realities of the mystery schools that prevent men and women in this age through the malintent of the dark forces from seeing reality, must be pierced. We must pierce the veil. We must penetrate through. We must be able to tie up these broken threads. We must understand life. And we have a right to probe the nature of God in ourselves and in others. There is nothing wrong with that. We should be able to probe the nature of God, for this is how we do it. We do it through identification with it, because this is the embryonic power of God. Embryonic in us, but all-powerful in the universe. We will master our lives. We will master the universe. And we will be able to do it without clashing with one another. Do you remember the time one of the masters told us in a dictation of how that eight or ten people could attain a state of consciousness where they could control the weather absolutely? And he said, now, all of these eight or ten people that had such absolute control of the weather could have different ideas as to what type of weather they would want on any particular day. So one would say, well, I'm a farmer and I want rain today because my crops need it. Another one would say, well, I want sunshine because I'm going out for a hike in the woods. Another would say, well, I think I'd like to have a fog. There's some reason why I want this fog and so on, you see. And many different reasons why we'd have this variety of weather. But if they all lived in the same area and they all wanted to control the weather and they all had the power to control the weather, it's like the old story of the irresistible force coming up against the immovable object because something has to give. And that is where you have the division of law. The division of law which always takes the number of individuals in a given situation and tries to equate to them what is the best gift to these people. But of course, many of these problems that are so easily identified on earth do not exist in heaven. 
Because in the higher states of consciousness, we do not have the same laws functioning as we do here. Our environment, of course, is entirely different and quite wonderful. And our power of vision and all of the senses of the divine, which are carried up into the higher octaves, are far more beautiful than anything that we have here. Some of the people who have unfortunately involved themselves in the taking of harmful drugs and have sought to take the kingdom of heaven by storm have had minor experiences in some of the lower astral realms and have occasionally reached the borders of some of the higher astral realms. But this is nothing beside the involvement of the soul in finding its own reality. I could give some descriptive passages to you tonight that would probably thrill some of you so that I don't really know what would happen to you tonight. I would be almost afraid to turn you loose. I'm serious about this. Because we could stimulate, and the masters could stimulate, such eagerness in your hearts to see what your real potential is that it might be almost spiritually unhealthy. And so we do sometimes restrain individuals a bit because there is a need for it. We must not take the kingdom of heaven by storm, but we must understand that the fertile valley of the garden of our heart is the place that God is prepared to receive the divine seed. And there it must flourish, watered, by the power of the word of the Logos, receiving the sun of illumination, the warmth and revivification of that sun, and then sending forth germinal shoots that like the nerve trunk coming up through the spinal stalk and emanating out through the whole structure of man will eventually take control over that body by acting as antakarana, as the connecting link between the remote parts of identity and the heart center of identity. We all then must grasp this principle because we all are alive now as we have never been alive before because Jesus said, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end. And he said, I and my Father are one. And you shall be one with me, and I shall be one with the Father. And this is the goal of every master and should be the goal of every disciple, to give to the children of this world the love of the highest that is in us, to understand that this love can be cultivated, that the electrical energy of that love can be amplified within the force field of our being until the surge of that love is the rejuvenation of eternity functioning in the domain of time. And you will feel it, and you can live in it, and you can charge the atoms and cells of your body, and you can penetrate the universe with your mind, and you can part the veil of matter and see spirit before you and the lightning flash of the love of God coming down. I am that I am. This means that you have the embryonic power of Almighty God, but you must face the initiatic process of the cosmic lords. Well, what in the world are we dealing with now? What cosmic lords? I thought there was only one God. And it is true, there is only one God. But we must learn that that one God took that loaf and he broke the bread and he divided it. And we see in the myriad children of men the manifestations of God scattered all throughout the earth and we see the manifestations of God as the crumbs of Eucharist scattered throughout the universe and we see that the whole loaf of identity that is us all and more is indeed more. For there is a spiritual realm of transcendent miracle producing consciousness that is the grace of God that like the leaven of yeast fills the universe and raises it ever higher. For science tells us now that the whole universe is in the process of expansion and we are no exception to that expansion. But today, what are we dealing with? 
We are dealing with the iron bands of dogma that have confined men to the flesh and have said, you shall either go to heaven or you shall go down that way. And the whole question becomes whether or not you accept our dogma. If you accept our dogma, if you will accept the ablutions that we recommend and the concepts that we hold, then and only then can you go up. But you will have no assurance until the hour of your death as to whether or not you are going up. And even then you may not have the assurance. This is not the plan of God. Because the Father foreknew from the beginning his intent for the Son, and the Son is the flame. The Son is the power of the I am in the burning bush, and this simply means identity. But now we can examine through sensar, the ancient Atlantean language, the very word identity, and we find the concept of the I first which is the power to perceive being. And you can spell that I, not with a capital I, but with an E-Y-E, -E, because it is the power of the spiritual I that makes the whole body full of light. The I that sees the allness of God in the self as well as in the universe and reflects it. Now we have the word I, and we have the word den, D-E-N, I, T-Y, identity, what does it really mean? What is a den? It's a place, isn't it? Foxes live in dens, don't they? Animals live in dens. So the I den is simply the concentration of the power of the personality you see, that abides in a place. Generally, this is a cocoon. What is a cocoon? You know how the little worm is inside the cocoon, and then after a while, it shatters the cocoon, and out comes the butterfly flying into the sun. Well, that is what we are when we stop to think of ourselves as a den or a density. It's a concentration of energy. And this energy is like the bark on trees. Not just the bark, the rings is what I meant to say. It's the concentric rings, the winding around ourselves of the shrouds of identity. It's a tie that links us to the personality. But we are concerned with the nature, the true identity, not the false identity. So we now recognize that we have a duality. And what is the word duality? It's the do-all I tie. <laughs> now you look at the do-all I tie and you find out that you have two parts to your being. You find that you have a part that relates to the seven days of creation. You find that the Lord God made man in his own image. And that's the first part of you. And then you find out that you created yourself by what you did with that image. You took the energy of the image and you build it around the white fire core of that energy, all of the imperfection and density and the winding of the shroud of death that caused Jesus to say to them, you whited sepulchers, you are full of dead men's bones. And there was genuine wisdom in what he said. Oh, it sounded a bit foolish to the materialist or the intellectualist who did not understand what he was talking about. But he was simply talking about the layers of density that were wrapped around them, that made them walking sepulchers. And he was talking about the, the dead men's bones. That's the records of their past lives that were unfruitful. Lifetime after lifetime, they had lived, they had eaten, they had drunk, they had married, they had given in marriage, they had been a very fine vegetable, and they had died as well as been born. 
and all this accumulation and structuring was more or less meaningless when it should have been meaningful. And so he was telling them the truth about themselves. So that, of course, is one side of man and the other side is the divine side and it's the divine side we're concerned with. And the divine side is so wonderful. But you more or less have to create a hieroglyphic language of the spirit and then you have to take these hieroglyphs, this meaningful language that you will create in your own being and you have to translate spiritual things until they become real to you. You have to bridge the gap the chasm between the identity of God and the identity of man. And the masters have again and again pointed out the need for us to do this. If we don't do it sometime, someplace, somewhere, we will come to the marriage feast of the Lamb, and when we come to the marriage feast, we will not have on a wedding garment. The wedding garment of the Lamb this snow white robe is the electrical regenerative power that comes into our consciousness as we bid the Holy Spirit to cultivate that spiritual spark within ourselves and ask that the flow be increased in order to transmute the density of the bush through which the flame blazes. Oh, that's mystical, isn't it? It's very mystical because the bush is not consumed. And so I draw this to a close to tell you that God has, out of mercy, tempered the wind to the shorn lamb of man's identity and given you and I and every man and woman and child on this planet, the opportunity, if it can be conveyed to him and he can receive it, to become in his time a living Christ. And ye shall drink of the cup that I have drunk, and ye shall be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. This is the spirit of the regeneration and you shall follow me in the regeneration. Meaning that we shall follow him and the power of his example in the regenerative experience of climbing the 33 steps of the spinal ladder to the place of the skull, Golgotha, where the Christ is crucified between the two lobes of the pituitary, the anterior and posterior, being crucified between the two malefactors, and where the spiritual eye is opened, flooding the whole body with the light of the spirit and creating the currents of regeneration around the spinal altar that will not only enable us to turn to ashes the results of our own past karma but to actually be carried by the spirit wherever the spirit wishes to carry us and the spirit wishes to carry us only one way and that is up and whereas Bishop Pike of the Episcopal Church seriously questioned the ascension saying, which way is up? We who understand the meaning of it realize that up to us is elevation of consciousness. And consciousness is everywhere. But what kind of consciousness are we manifesting? The consciousness of God that holds the mind of crystal light through which the pureness of the ray of the Father can shine, 
the consciousness of God that holds all virtue for his creation in his being and mind, the consciousness of God that bids the life forms that he has created to permanently remain and be immortalized, the consciousness of God that breaks the bonds that hold us hypnotically to the spells of human creation that for ages have kept us bound, the consciousness of God that brings freedom into the soul. This is what we want and this is what we must have if we are to be made whole. And therefore, not in one easy lesson, but out of the instruction of the brotherhood given periodically and thoroughly, we build layer upon layer into the consciousness of man the structures that have meaning, the structures of the light that sound the death knell to bondage, that toll an end of human suffering, that herald by their trumpeting the coming in of the millennium of light, the thousand year reign, when man shall by the spirit of truth cleave asunder the root of error, expose it to view and wither it by the flame, and then stand forth and shine as the sun in his strength, because God intended it so. So be it. It has been written, so shall it be done. It has been written, so shall it be done. It has been written, so shall it be done.